Thank you, Dr. Tarver. And our next speaker this morning is Dr. Lacey Washington from Duke University. She'll speak to us about mediastinal abnormalities, chest radiograph observations. All right. Um, so the objectives for this talk this morning are that you would become familiar with the concept of mediastinal compartments and with the tools you'll need to analyze them in, on chest radiographs to analyze mediastinal abnormalities. Um, and we're going to be discussing mediastinal anatomy in a case-based uh, format based on uh, the idea of mediastinal compartments. Um, and we're all familiar with the idea of anterior, middle, and posterior mediastinal compartments. But what I, we may not all be as familiar with, and what confused me when I was a resident, is that in fact these compartments are defined differently by different authors. And that's because unlike, say, the peritoneal spaces, uh, the divisions in the mediastinum are just related to the location. There's no fascial planes dividing the uh, different parts of the mediastinum, no um, barriers to disease spread, and so um, I'm going to be using, for purposes of this talk, uh, a cl classification that's basically anterior, middle, and posterior, um, but it comes from its, its words that are a little bit more specific and more helpful from this chapter um, in imaging of the diseases of the chest. Um, we're going to be talking about the anterior mediastinum or prevascular region, but also a separate pericardiac region. And then the middle mediastinum is kind of the, we're, we're going to be defining as the paratracheal, subcranial, and paraesophageal region, and then finally the paravertebral or more posterior region. And we'll be doing this, as I said, in a case-based format. So let's start out by looking at this obviously very abnormal chest radiograph. And the first thing that we're, uh, we're going to just be looking at the anterior film uh, AP film here, just to try to give everybody an idea of how much information there is on this single film. So the first thing I look at when I'm looking at this film is that I see that the descending thoracic aorta is very well outlined and pretty normal in appearance. The right paratracheal stripe also appears maybe a little abnormal, but mostly not nowhere near as abnormal as, as this big mediastinal mass is. And the left paraspinous interface I also see pretty normally through the, uh, the mass. So this um, mass doesn't seem to be involving uh, those structures that Dr. Denny spoke to us about before. But I do notice that the heart border is not well seen. And so that helps me localize this as a prevascular mass. Um, so we all know the differential diagnosis for prevascular masses, the classic four Ts. For thyroid masses, now those are usually pretty high and may deviate the trachea, um, may, be more of a, may extend back into the more middle mediastinum. Germ cell tumors, which are uh, get their T from teratoma, but also include other germ cell tumors like seminomas and non-seminomas germ cell tumors. Thymic lesions and lymphadenopathy, which can be in every, any compartment of the mediastinum and gets its T from terrible in lymphoma. Um, so this is a prevascular mass. We can see that confirmed in the lateral view and uh, on CT, this is a large uh, anterior mediastinal mass um, and lymphoma. Okay, next case. We see a large rounded mass down, further down uh, in the cardiophrenic angle. Um, and we notice that the right heart border is obscured when you compare it with the left, which is very sharply delineated. So this is a pericardiac mass. You notice that it's abutting the diaphragm, although it's not obscuring it. You can see the diaphragm right through it. That tends to localize it very, fairly anteriorly because the dome of the diaphragm is a little bit more posterior in the chest. And the differential diagnosis for pericardiac masses is divided into those that are in contact with the diaphragm, uh, such as pericardial cysts, large fat pads, and morgagni hernias, um, and lymphadenopathy, which can be anywhere. And then those that generally aren't in contact with the diaphragm, um, although there will be exceptions, but the thymic lesions and germ cell tumors. So this mass, uh, we can see confirmed on the lateral that it is a very anteriorly located mass. And on CT, this is a completely water attenuation uh, mass with an imperceptible wall, classic pericardial cyst. 
All right, now we have another obviously abnormal mediastinal contour. Um, and again, we're going to try to localize it as much as we can on the frontal radiograph. And unlike the last two masses, we can see that this sticks out beyond the heart border, but it does not obscure the right heart border. Um, on the other hand, it does uh, deviate and seem to arise from the azigoesophageal recess interface. And so it also elevates the right main bronchus. And so this uh, is a subcrinal mass in that middle mediastinal group of paratracheal, subcrinal, and paraesophageal masses. And the differential diagnosis for these includes foregut duplication cysts, esophageal lesions, uh, thyroid lesions. Um, so again, remember, thyroid does, th these, these compartments are not discrete. Um, so they can, ex thyroid can extend back. Aneurysms and vascular anomalies and other vascular abnormalities, and again, Lymphadenopathy can be anywhere. Um, and you can see on the lateral that this is a sort of a more middle mediastinal lesion. And this is a pretty classic uh, location for an appearance for a large bronchogenic cyst. Uh, unlike the pericardial cysts, these don't have to be of uh, pure water attenuation. They can be proteinaceous, but they should not enhance, obviously, with contrast. All right. Here's another mass, and this one, like uh, one we saw before, is sort of located in the uh, cardiophrenic angle, but um, it doesn't obscure the right heart border. And we see it outlined by air extending well below the diaphragm. So the lung extends posteriorly far more inferiorly than it does anteriorly. So um, that, that would suggest that it's in a posterior location. And the right paraspinous interface, which is not always that well seen, so it's not necessarily that helpful, but it isn't seen here. And so this is a paravertebral mass. The paravertebral mass differential includes neurogenic tumors, lymphadenopathy, which can be anywhere, extramedullary hematopoiesis, mesenchymal tumors, and again, esophageal lesions, so they can extend backwards. Um, this is a CT on that patient. You can see the paravertebral mass, and you'll also notice high attenuation in the liver in this patient uh, with thalassemia and extramedullary hematopoiesis. All right, let's look at a few more cases. Um, where is this finding? Um, I, just to note that on all of the other ones we've looked at, the lateral view has been really helpful, but when, it's, when they're small like this, not necessarily very helpful at all. So here's our list of possible locations. How are we going to localize it? Well, we notice that the descending thoracic aorta is very well seen right through the lesion. Um, but the lesion appears continuous with the left paraspinous interface. And so that would suggest that we're probably dealing with a paravertebral lesion. And here's a CT on this patient, both uh, axial and coronal images, and you can see this paravertebral lesion. This is the much more common than extramedullary hematopoiesis uh, nerve sheath tumor. These are the most common paravertebral masses. All right. Another mass that you might be tempted to, or a mass like opacity that you might be tempted to call uh, posterior, because it's extending, you can see it outlined by air very posteriorly down behind the dome of the diaphragm. Um, but we're gonna give you an, a diff, uh, an extra possibility. This could be none of the above, right? It doesn't have to be in the mediastinum just because it's projecting over the mediastinum. And you'll notice, if you look carefully, that the uh, left main bronchus is extending right into this lesion. So this is an example of left lower lobe collapse, um, not a mediastinal mass. So always look at all the structures, uh, not just the interfaces, but the structures within the mediastinum. OK, this is an extremely subtle case. Um, you can see a normal right paratracheal stripe medial to the mass on the right. Um, the normal descending thoracic or aorta medial to the mass on the left, um, and a normal paraspinous interface medial to both. So this is hard to see, but there is an anterior mediastinal, there is a mass here, and all these interfaces being well preserved suggest that it's probably anterior or prevascular, and here it is on CT. 
And so the differential diagnosis for this, is this gonna be a thyroid lesion? Remember, this is our, supposed to be our four Ts. No, this isn't a thyroid lesion. It doesn't, it's in the wrong location. So just because it's anterior doesn't mean you have to include it. Could it be a thymic lesion? Sure. What's the patient's age? Things like that. Could it be a teratoma? No. It's very, very bland, homogeneous, anterior mediastinal mass. Not gonna be a teratoma, no fat, no fluid, no bone, bone no nothing. Um, seminoma or germ cell tumor? Well, if you didn't see the little bit of breast tissue on this patient, it could be, but this is a young woman and those are tumors of men. And could this be a lymphoma? Yes, this could. So depending upon the age, this is gonna be either a thymic lesion or a lymphoma. And sometimes the more you know, you have a shorter rather than longer differential diagnosis. One more uh, case, where is this finding located? Um, it, the trachea has shifted to the left, so this is gonna put this in that middle mediastinal, paratracheal, paraesophageal, and subcarinal lesion differential. And this is that differential diagnosis. And there's really not much we can do beyond that on this case. You have a long differential diagnosis. But we have another case um, that looks pretty similar, also with a big right paratracheal thing deviating the trachea to the left. But look around and see if there's a, can anybody see what's missing on this case? There's no normal left aortic arch. So in this case, we can look at the same finding on a plain film and come up with a very specific differential diagnosis rather than a long list of possibilities. Okay, so um, my objectives for this talk were uh, to give you familiarity with the mediastinal compartments in the context of uh, the radiographic analysis of uh, lines and stripes that so nicely discussed by Dr. Denny, and I hope we've done that. And thank you so much for your attention.